2 Kings chapter 4. Make sure my screen's still on. I didn't know, but halfway through Sunday school, the thing went off. But that's why I tell you to bring your Bible, look in your Bible, read your Bible, study your Bible, check your Bible, and make sure I'm telling you what's right. Pray for me this morning uh, that God will open up His hand. He'll bless you today. Uh, I'm, I feel like the man in the Bible that some visitors came to him and was on a long journey and he didn't have any food to give him, so he went to borrow from his neighbor, knocked on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night, and uh, the man had to tell his neighbor, I've got some friends on a long journey, and I have nothing to give them. Will you rise and give us bread? And that's kind of how I feel today, like I have nothing to give, so I'm going to ask God to rise and give somebody some bread today, all right? Free, free bread. Free bread. You don't owe God for it. Last Sunday morning, um, God laid it on my heart to sort of teach about debt and what all the Bible says about debt, either being in debt or have someone indebted to you. And uh, this morning I want to kind of continue uh, along that same theme and use that to maybe help us understand where we stand with God before we're saved and after we're saved. And it's like, Lynn, I'm going to bring that in to the deal this morning, okay? There's often bitterness between people. But we think they owe us an apology. That's a debt. When you say you owe me an apology, that to you is a debt. They are indebted to you, and the debt's not clear until they pay it with and I'm sorry, all right? And those two words are probably the hardest words in English to say that we have. I'm sorry, or I apologize. Because our pride never wants to admit that we did or said anything wrong. Never wants to do that. We want to feel justified in our feelings about people by making or putting a casting a debt on them like they owe us an apology or they must come to us first and that's not really what Jesus said if we think about what our Lord said concerning if we know someone has transgressed are we supposed to wait for them to come to us? Or did Jesus say that we're supposed to go to them? And the whole point of going to them is to not enforce the indebtedness, but to forgive it. To wipe it away as if it had never been there. So, in Aline Estes' mind... Her last thought before her mind left. Her mind left her before her body did. But her last thoughts were that her children get along. It's what she wanted. And so, Lynn, I have absolutely no doubt that God brought that thing about at Walmart. What better place? Amen? Was there anything on sale? Okay, had no idea. But anyway... So now, the, from what I understand, the debt's cleared. Now, that does not mean that they're going to have barbecues every weekend together. Sometimes people just don't need to hang around each other. But at least now, the debt is cleared. Okay? So think about that. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. There cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying... Thy servant, my husband, is dead. Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. 
and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And I want you to think about at the end of your life, the creditor's coming. The creditor's coming. And something has to be given. Something has to be paid. That debt has got to be cleared. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the, in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Thou shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. Now you get the picture. She went, he told her to go out and get all the vessels you can, in your house, and then go to your neighbors and get all any vessels that they got laying around, ask them, don't steal them, ask them, and bring them in to, to this house. And that's what she's done. Now she's got this one pot of oil. And you got to understand, oil is everything to these people. It's their light. It's, it's, it, it mixes with their meal. Some of you know how to cook better than I do, but it mixes with their meal. It's how they're going to make their cakes. they got to have a little oil in with it. I mean, who wants to eat? powdered flour okay I mean you might live on it but it ain't good going down so the oil is everything all right so she absolutely needs this so she went for him shut the door verse 6 and it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son bring me yet a vessel and he said unto her there's not a vessel more and the oil stayed now look at verse 7 and she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. When David prayed that prayer to God and wrote that psalm, Psalm 23, he did not say, My cup is half empty, or my cup is half full, and he did not even say that his cup was full. He said, my cup runneth over. We serve a wealthy God. He's rich. He has abundance. He has overflow. And it is nothing to Him to give and to give and to give and to give. There's some people, when they give, they give a little bit, but they've given practically everything that they had. That's a big deal to them. With God, He has the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the hills. He owns every rock and piece of dust in the, in the heavens and in the earth. He owns all the gold, all the silver of heaven. He owns everything. And so it's nothing for God to just give and to give and to give and to give, not just to get us by. For this one thing, the man of God was not just telling her, we're going to pay your debts off, now the rest is up to you. He not only paid her debts off, but I believe that she had enough to live the rest of her life. So that, watch this now, not only is she not in debt right now, but for the rest of her life, she had no need of borrowing ever again. All of that, she was living in the overflow. I sound like a TV evangelist trying to get you to write a check. Because that's how they talk. We're supposed to live in the overflow, bless God. Okay? It all starts with you writing a check for $1,000 to this ministry. Kind of what it puts me in the mind of. But I'm just a believer in God's Word and what God says and how God gives it. Now, you may want to take this and apply it to money. You may want to take it to a, and apply it to a lot of different things. But let me tell you where this really boils down to. Mercy. Mercy. Let's pray, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. You've got to pray first. Heavenly Father, I need your help today. I'm not with it today. I don't have a lot in me. 
to give out to anybody. And maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's not, I don't know, but God, I'm just telling you and I'm telling you in front of these people. God, you know my frame, you know my mind and my heart, my heart's right. But I just don't feel like, Lord, I have much to contribute today. So, Father, this message will have to be you, needs to be you. And I'm asking God that you would not only just give a little, but God, that you would give a lot. Father, that you'd have mercy on me and that you would have mercy on these people because you're rich in mercy. So, Father, help me to preach. Help me, Lord, to just stick with your word and give out, Lord, the scriptures, God, that you've laid on my heart. And, Lord, let it be a blessing to somebody today who's either coming by this place, either here or online, and they didn't know what they needed, but, Lord, they find out at the end of the message from you what they needed in life. And pray, Lord, it would be that kind of blessing. Lord, make the devil go outside. He don't belong in here. And, Lord, just keep this place and keep these people, Lord. Help us, Lord, to love one another. Help me to love them. Help me to love you, Father. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, mercy. When you came to God, let me get back a little bit in my notes. When you came to God, you had, I mentioned this last Sunday, your debt of sin was enormous. We spend a lifetime spending sin or using, I could call it the sin credit card. I, Caleb asked me what the difference between credit card and debit card was yesterday. Debit card, when you hit the end of your money in your bank account, you're supposed to be, not be able to use it anymore. So a debit card means you can use it until the money runs out, and then you don't have it, and you can't buy nothing else with it. A credit card, in some people's minds, is an endless spending, 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 never ends, and never pay the debt. I was made aware yesterday, there are some people in life who do nothing but rack up debt. And they have absolutely no intention of ever paying it. Ever. There are people in this country who have multiple... Now, I, I blame the credit card companies partly for this. Because they... Let me tell you what some of the credit card companies will do. They'll go to college campuses on the day that these freshmen move in. And they set up a table... And they grab these young college kids who are out away from mom and daddy and say, our credit card company, you've, this is your lucky day. We're going to give you your own brand spanking new credit card with your name and it's all yours. Sign the paper. And I've read stories of young men and women in their 20s who took a gun and blew their brains out because by the time they were finished with college, not only did they have the college debt to pay off, but they had racked up so much debt with their college credit card that they would have never been able to, they were in their 20s and were in debt a quarter of a million dollars. And they realized that they'll never be able to pay it and they just ended their life. But now they have a worse debt. To pay but we have a God who when we came to God he forgave every sin that we had committed just like that now the debt wasn't just forgiven you understand it was paid for do you understand that Elisha, in this, in this story we read, he did not tell her 
well, I'm just going to go around to all these people you owe money to and tell them to get over it. That wasn't right. It's not even in the law that way. In the law, if you owe a debt, you got to pay it. And the whole purpose of setting people free was not to just let everybody wiggle out of all their debts. They had to pay it. And Elisha knew that. And he did not just say to this woman, I'm just going to go clear all your debts. Don't worry about it. He provided for her the means for the debt to be paid. So, the price of that was God's only begotten son. Somebody has to pay the bill. And since you can't do it, God did it for you. But see this thing here, he says, Go sell the oil and pay the debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. What that means to me is, God is so rich in mercy that he has not only forgiven every sin that you had committed up until the time that you got saved, but he continues to forgive those sins and transgressions. There's still oil of mercy left over for you to live on. 1 John, I don't even have to turn there, I know it by heart. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If God is anything in this Bible, the, the Bible says God is rich in mercy. Somebody say amen. He's wealthy. I serve a wealthy God. Amen. Now, let me kind of, I got my notes scattered. I tried to put them in order last night and I'm already out of order. Okay. But let's, let's go to um, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. This is going to be another baloney sermon. I don't mean nonsense. I mean it's a big slab of baloney. We can cut it off anywhere we need to. By the way, I tried. I never had this before. Who in here has ever had Lebanon baloney? Lebanon style bologna. I didn't know there was such a monster. And there's a little Amish or Mennonite store down in Farmington that Lisa and I go to every now and then. And I, I like bologna. I'm not too high up to admit I love fried bologna sandwich. But this was Lebanon bologna. And I said, can I, can I try a little hunk of that? And that fellow took it and sliced me off a couple pieces. And whew, it's good, isn't it, Caleb? Oh, yeah. I said, give me a pound of that. You ought to try it. Maybe next time if I like you, I might buy you some of it. Okay? So I'm not giving just normal bologna. I'm giving you some of that good Lebanon bologna. You ought to try it, all right? Romans chapter 4, are you there? Say amen. Look at your Bible. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Abraham is our father in the flesh, and this is what Abraham discovered. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was, see that, what's that next word? Counted. This is an accounting terminology. Accounting terminology. Uh, you've seen this picture flip by here a couple times. Let me get it up on the screen. See that picture there? Is it up there? Okay. What is this person doing? Balancing, but there's another word for it. Who said reconciling? The bank sends you a list of all the checks you wrote, and the, it's a bank statement. They send you all the checks you wrote, all the deposits you made, and you're supposed to take your checkbook, your personal ledger, because you ought to, this, we don't use debit cards much. We, well, we do more now than we used to, but we grew up in an age where we didn't have them, and my mama taught me to take a checkbook 
and to write everything down or you'll just be writing checks everywhere and think you've got money and you don't have money. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to keep account of the checks you wrote. And what this person in this picture is doing is called reconciliation. Because the bank says one thing, but what does your check register, your check ledger say? And this goes to that deal about us being dishonest to ourselves. You can even lie in your own check ledger, can't you? You can, well, I wrote that check, but I'm not going to write it down. That way it looks like I got more than what I really got. And some people actually think this way and live this way. It's obvious to me that most people live this way toward God. This good deeds, bad deeds thing. To them is a check ledger and they're always loading it with all their good deeds but they're missing some of their bad deeds. So in their mind, they are reconciled with God because they just didn't write down everything that God wrote down. Does God write down your sins? You better believe He does. I would be scared to death and I think we probably all would, if somebody from the NSA came to you with a big printout of all the stuff they have on you. All the phone calls, text messages, emails, internet browser history, financial records, places that you went, people that you talked to, everything that you did, our government keeps, Google keeps track of it, right? Everything's written down and God writes everything down. And if, and if you, in your mind, don't keep track of your own sins, you might think you're doing okay, but you're not. And people live in their minds with the idea that they are good people. And God's going to weigh it all out at the end and He's going to say, well... I guess it'll work. You're okay. But any honest person will reconcile themselves with God and they'll look at their life and their sins and then they'll look at what God has written down and they'll see that they're far short. And the term, we use the term checkbook reconciliation is because you don't want to be at odds with the bank. How many of y'all know that? You don't want to be at odds with the bank. You owe money on a house or a car or whatever. You don't want to be at odds with the bank. The bank will come and take your stuff away and they'll have the right to do it. That's what debt does. So back to Romans 4. Man, I love this because God's using that exact kind of language. It was counted unto him for righteousness. So verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of what? Debt. Do you see it? So, to all the people out there in all the religions, including phony Christianity, whose religion is all about what they do, how they appear, the amount of money that they give, Everything external, nothing internal, and it's all about their alleged works of righteousness to all of the people out there who that's your God and that's your religion. I will tell you that you are more in debt than you can possibly imagine. Because there are people, I, listen, I grew up fundamental. I've been around fundamentalists. I know how some of them think. It's all about the appearance. It's all about the outside. It's all about having an outward form of morality and all of the good things they do or all the sermons they preach 
or all the board meetings they attend, or all the money that they pay, or all the Sunday school classes that they taught, or all the soul winning that they did, the door knocking, the bus ministry. It's all about what they did, and they think that they're keeping themselves right with God by their good deeds. They have no idea how much sin is actually in their life. And to me, a lot of that outside stuff, that outward doing and that outward show is nothing more than their own cover-up of their own sins. And if we're not careful, we can get arrogant and cocky that way and think, well, we believe the King James and we live this way and we don't do this way. We don't do these things, so we must be better than everybody else. But the problem is, let me show you how God sees this. If a man is a million dollars in debt, he's in debt. If a man is a hundred dollars in debt, he is in debt. And if you have absolutely no money to pay it back, what difference does it make if it's a hundred dollars or a million dollars? God sees it all as debt. You say, I don't believe that. The book of James says that if we offend the law in one point, we are in debt. We are guilty of the whole of the law. If you break a contract in one point, you have broken the con The contract's broken. It's been breached. And there must be a repair of that breach. There must be a payer of the debt. There must be something done to put that, to reconcile that back together, to justify it. Something has to be done. You can't, you can't just let it go. You can't ignore debt and think it's going to go away. You can't ignore the sins that you're committing and think that, well, if, uh, over time, God will just get over it. So if you want to live a semi-righteous life and work it out with God that way, what Paul is telling you is you're always going to be in debt. You're never going to get paid up. Ezekiel chapter 33, God made it clear that in the day that a righteous man sins, all of his righteousnesses are gone. So let's say you've got, let's say you've got a million dollars in your righteousness checkbook. Well, committing one sin is a billion dollars. So what have you done? You've wiped out everything that you've done. And now you're in debt. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. We talked about justification in Sunday school. I'm going to explain it in a minute. His faith is counted. There it is again. His faith is counted for righteousness. Faith. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God, look at the word impute. And I looked that word up. And the summation of what the word impute means, it means to charge against. It's an accounting word. Imputed. He, God imputeth righteousness without works, saying... Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. There it is. Charge against. He will not charge you for these sins. Now, let me use this illustration. Back in old times, in the days of our forefathers. See, we got health insurance and you can even take out a form of insurance that will help you with all your legal bills. But in the old days, lawyers and doctors had to be paid like everybody else has to be paid. That's their work. It's their living. You're not smart enough to cure yourself, so you go to a doctor. And back in the old days, when people didn't have money, Chris, they still owed a debt to the doctor. He's got to live. He's got to pay his bills. He's got to feed his family. How is it that you went to him to set your son's broken arm or to cut out some kind of something, another, a tumor or something like that where they had, you know, to give him a block of wood and cutting it out, you know, somebody. He's got to be paid for that. 
They didn't have money. What'd they do? Well, we got chickens. Doctor says, well, I like chicken. He's a good Baptist. Amen. I like chicken. Well, we got cows. How about eggs? We got fre we have fresh eggs every day. We got milk. And we make butter and cheese. So, doctor, instead of money, will you let us pay you in pickles? Will you let us pay you in tomatoes? Will you let us pay you in a cow or with some sheep that we have or with some milk or whatever? Doctor, will you let us pay you some other way? And the doctor says, absolutely. And in this case, the other form of payment that we give to God is our belief. Look, look at what he says. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Your faith is just as good as you keeping the law to begin with and not getting in debt. Boy, the Bible's good, isn't it? Even as he justified the ungodly, his faith accounted for righteousness. Even as David, verse, and he's reading Psalm uh, 32. I love Psalm 32, man, I love this. Turn there real quick. Psalm 32. So that oil that that woman had, the oil was enough, number one, to pay all of the debts up until that day. But it was more. It was more than she needed to pay the current debt. It was her daily living. I don't know about you, but I live daily on God's mercy, God's grace. Lynn, it was grace that brought you and your sister together. It was grace that God laid it on Sam Walton's heart to put a Walmart right here in this town. That's what, the third one we've had? Okay, third Walmart building we've had. That was grace that God did all that for you. He not only saved Danny, saved your mom and dad, but he saved you, and he's still giving you oil to live on every single day. That's how much overflow that we live in. And God has, he's very, God, where did this oil come from, by the way? The pots came from the neighbors. Where did the oil come from? Nothing. They were, it was created exactly the same way God created the whole world. He created it out of nothing. Out of thin air. So, young people, when your parents say, what do you think, money just comes out of thin air? Say, well, it does in the Bible. I, no, don't try that. Because you'll find out what blood tastes like. Amen. Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 6, For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. A godly person is the one living under the blessing of God's daily mercy for them. And God takes your debt, your sin debt, and the form of payment for that debt that He accepts is you believe what God said in His Word. And you do that every day. Who's been saved one year or less, raise your hand. Who's been saved five years or less? Raise your hand. Okay? Ten years. Twenty years. Thirty years. Forty years. Fifty years. We're getting there. Sixty years. We've got a few of us left. God gave as much grace 
as the people needed who've only been saved less than five years and then the people who've been saved over 60 years. God's, that's all grace. That's oil overflow oil that God has given. So those of you who've been saved less, the people who are sitting next to you will tell you, hey, I'm still living in the overflow oil of God's rich mercy. Somebody say amen. Okay? But that's what that word impute means. God takes the sin and imputes it. He takes the payment of faith and puts it in that ledger. So now you and God are reconciled. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What that means is, again, the debt did not just disappear. Somebody had to make it clear. Somebody had to pay it. Somebody had to bear your debt burden and take it on themselves. And Isaiah 53 is all about Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch found that out. On his way to Jerusalem to go worship, Philip jumped in the chariot, opened up his King Philip Bible. I thought I'd throw that in there. His King Philip Virgin Bible, because the eunuch said, what does this mean? And Philip translated it for him, interpreted it for him, told him what it meant. And now the eunuch is in heaven where we're going to be one of these days. Acts chapter 13. Be it known unto you, therefore, men, verse 38, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from what? All things. Be, uh, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. But that idea of justification is also a word that we use in application to when we are working on our checkbook register and we're taking it, we have the bank statement, we have the checkbook, or you have a, a statement of debt that the loan company or the mortgage company or the bank has sent you. They they put it out in a ledger, how much money you've paid, how much of it went to the interest, how much of it went to the... Boy, when you look at how much money goes to the interest, that gets you, doesn't it? You're going to those stinking banks. I hate them. But then we got our hand out next time. Can I borrow money? But we're paying off. The, and if your register, your list, does not match with the banks, then you are not reconciled with them. Do you understand that? If you have one sin, you are not reconciled with God. One sin is sin. One debt is debt. It doesn't matter. All Sin must be reconciled. Must be. Must be justified. Now, look, look down. I said this in Sunday school, but look down at the page of your Bible. Look at your Bible. I want you to notice in your Bible, it doesn't matter what page it is, that the left side of the letters and the right side of the letters are all in a straight line. If you've ever used a word processor, what is that called? Justification. There's a little menu button in Microsoft Word, uh, LibreOffice. Doesn't matter which one you're using, pages from, uh, from uh, Apple. There's a little button there. You press it, and it takes all your typed text, and it lines it up on both sides. And I like that look. When we print something like we print books here, the text is justified on both sides. Did you hear what I said? Justified on both sides. And that word justified means it's straight up and both sides are in agreement. That's you and God. God is the one whose ledger is perfect, by the way. Because He not only records... I mean, somebody might follow you around and write down all the words that you said that weren't quite kosher. And they might 
they might be able to follow you around and write down some of the things you did. But who is it that knows the sins in your mind? God does. And the word covetousness is a mind sin. And God writes them all down. And those are debt. And that debt must be paid. I'm going to read a couple more verses. I'm going to let you go. Romans chapter 3, turn there. In fact, we'll, we'll stop here. We'll cut the, the baloney off right here. In fact, I think probably that they call them German Baptist in Indiana. Those, there's German, German Baptist delis out there. They probably have some of that good Lebanon baloney. It, it tastes like summer sausage is what it's like. It's more like summer sausage than it is bologna. I wouldn't fry it. I just like it the way it is. Amen. Romans 3.20 Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be what? Justified in his, in his what? Sight. God's, look, God's one looking at it. And if it ain't lining up, if it's not justified on both sides, if it's not lining up, God knows it. You're not going to be able to get it by Him, ever. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that what? Believe. For there is no difference. That's what I just said. If it's a million dollars debt or a hundred dollars debt, it's debt. It's debt. If you've ever rented a place or rented something out to someone, it doesn't matter if they are $10,000 in arrears in their, in their rent or $500 in arrears in their rent, they're not going to pay it and you have to throw them out. Right? Right? Unless you just got a lot of places and you feel sorry for you, let them live there and you're just going to let it get by, that's fine. But it doesn't matter if it's $10,000 in rent they owe or $500 in rent they owe. They owe rent and they're not paying it. They have to be thrown out. It's not right. You have a debt. Verse 23, there is no difference. For Say this with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What is it that we say to somebody when we need to borrow money? Hey, can you help me out? I'm a little... Well, that's your mom and daddy's fault. You're short, all right? I'm, I'm a little short. I've got a debt to pay. If you go stand at Walmart and are checking out and you bought $100 worth of stuff and you pull out everything you've got and you've got $78, something's got to give. They're not going to let you walk out with $100 of stuff with only $78 to pay it. If you're short, you're short. Somebody's got to pay it. They're not going to sell you half of a barbecue grill because you can only pay for half of it, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. I've not looked it up, but I guarantee a propitiation is an accounting word. To be propitiated probably means to be justified and reconciled and debt-free. I'm just guessing. Propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission. See, the word remit is also a debt word. Will you remit the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that it might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter who sins the most or who sins the least. We've all short. And none of us can pay it. And since none of us can pay it, it's been paid by God's Son. And who is it that believes more than... You either believe or you don't believe. You either believe... Oh, you don't believe. A belief is, there's no degrees of belief that from what I can see, it's just you believe. And so who in here among us believes more than somebody else? 
If we say we believe God's Word, do we not all believe God's Word? So where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but, but the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Not works. Not payment. The payment that God accepts is faith. That, what is it Peter said? The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. I'd rather have faith than gold. I'd rather trust God than have money. Amen. I'll clap with you, brother. I'd rather have trust in God than all the riches in the world. I'd rather have that. Because there are days that I wake up that I know my mind ain't right. My mind ain't right with God. My spirit ain't right. Money can't fix that. Faith can. And only faith can fix that. I want you to bow your head.